Hello, everyone. I'd like to welcome you back to this amazing um, series that uh, we've been going through, myself and Dr. J. Smith, that has to do with the uh, historical criticism of Islam. We talked uh, at the beginning about the fact that Islam presents specific dates related to the birth of Islam and the birth of the Prophet, yet discoveries are contradicting that. Then we talked about Mecca, the historical, uh, basically, uh, uh, place for Mecca according to the Islamic tradition versus the discoveries that are contradicting that as well. Then we began to take a look at what we call the Qibla, which is the direction for prayer, and we discovered also that new discoveries, especially archaeological discoveries, have also contradicted some of the Islamic views related to the change of Qibla our direction of prayer from Jerusalem, at least according to the Islamic own understanding, to what we call today Mecca, even though the Quran really never mentioned both of these names when in 624 that direction changed. Dr. J, thank you again. And I think today we have a, a very interesting analysis that will conclude all of what we have talked about. So I'll give it over to you now. Yeah, let's just review and let's go back up on the slide again. Remember the four Qiblas uh, to get us into it. The first Qibla, uh, up until 706, every mosque, every mosque was facing Petra. None of them were facing any other direction but Petra from as far away as Guangzhou, way over there in China. You can see that on the map. Uh, you can see Chataman and Juma. That's way down in South India. Uh, all of them thousands of miles away were uniquely facing Petra. Then you have a second Qibla that's introduced in 706 in the early 8th century uh, to uh, place in between, almost exactly halfway between Petra and, and Mecca, showing you that there's something, there's an agenda here. That's right. Uh, so we're going to get to that agenda, we're, but well, let's hold on before we explain it uh, because we don't want to ju jump the ship. Uh, then finally, it's not till 727 that you finally get a mosque that's facing Mecca, where it should have been facing from 624. Because that's, according to the Quran, is when the, the Qibla was canonized. 624, we have to wait 100 years, over 100 years, 103 years, before we finally get a mosque that is facing Mecca. And then by 876 is when all mosques start facing. So there's still mosques that are facing other directions. Uh, uh, and then you get a fourth uh, Qibla, as you see on the slide there, and that's the parallel ones, the ones from North Africa. Why are they parallel? Why are they not facing Petra or Mecca? They seem to be facing a line that inter that follows between Petra and Mecca. That's why we call it the parallel mosque. So four different Qiblas. When we look at a graph there, you can see uh, that the most accurate of those Qiblas is the between ones. There, there's, there's a That's a political statement there. You can see why. And then the second most accurate would be the Petran, which are the earliest ones. You would then expect them to be the least accurate. That's correct. Because how do they have the technology? Ah, that's interesting. And the least, the least accurate of all the four Qiblas is the Meccan Qibla. Which is the later ones. Which is the last, the third one. Uh, but obviously, they didn't have that much accuracy. Muslims are trying to say they're the most No, they're not. Look at the statistics. The most accurate are the between ones and the Petran ones. They're much more accurate than the Meccan ones. Now, what's the significance of Petra? That's what we need to get to. Why Petra? What is this? Well, what is Petra? Well, take a look at this trade route map. Look where all the trades, the, the routes, the trade routes go through. They go through Petra. Obviously. Almost all of them go through Petra. It's obviously, it is the seat of trade from the far east, way off from China and India, all the spice trade, all the silk route, they all come through Petra. So what is Petra? Well, Petra is a Nabataean. It's the sanctuary city for the Nabataeans. The Nabataeans existed from the second century BC up until 713, look at that date, 713 AD, they, they had their sanctuary in Petra. Now, when you look at Petra today, you can see, it's, there's some pictures of it. You can see it's the city of tombs and temples. It is not a political capital. It is a religious capital. It's where the sanctuary is for the Nabataeans. Right. Hugely significant. Muslims should know that because Mecca is their religious capital, but it's not their political capital. It never has been their political capital. Even when Muhammad was living, according to their tradition, Medina was their political That's capital. That's correct. And we do know the Abbasids, I mean, sorry, the Umayyads, who were the next great dynasty, they made Damascus their headquarters, never Mecca. That's correct. And the Abbasids made Baghdad their headquarters. So it's significant here that we need to understand that the Nabataeans did not use 
uh, Petra as their political capital. It was their religious capital. It was their sanctuary. Uh, the Byzantines the same way, the Christians. Jerusalem was not their capital. Uh, the, the, uh, East, uh, Constantinople was their political capital. But Jerusalem is where the, uh, the church of, this, uh, of the sepulcher is. That was the religious uh, headquarters for the, the church in Jerusalem, and same for the Jews as well. So now let's go and let's look at the city of tombs and temples. Take a look at what we've noticed about Petra. Petra, according to that slide there, it's in a valley. Remember, all the traditions say that this place where the prophet lived is in a valley. That fits Petra. That it has a stream going through it. That really fits Petra. We have now found water courses. We found cisterns there. There are all kinds of evidence of water streams. There is a parallel valley there. We see that. You can see them right there on the on the on the map, looking of Petra. Yeah, two valleys going. There are the two valleys. It would be near Lot's Pillar of Salt because that is that where Lot would have come from, right outside of what is today Petra or in Jordan. It has fields. Al Bari says that it has trees, grass, fruit, and loam. That comes from Tirmidhi and Buhari and Al Tabari. It has olive trees because it's right there around the Mediterranean, Correct. where the olive trees would have been grown, and it has mountains all around it. That's why right, you overlooking. have overlooking. Oh, right, overlooking. So if there had been a Kaaba there, it would be there. Petra has all the items listed above from the Quran and Islamic traditions. Thus, could it be Petra that all the that both the traditions and the Quran are referring to? Because remember, it doesn't give a name to it. It just says the place of the prophet. And by the way, I mean, I'm just throwing this out there. There has been a recent discovery in Petra, at least the foundation of what appears to have been a shrine. That just was found last year. That's right. Uh, they're still discovered. And they found it by looking at from satellite imagery from space. Correct. It's so big that they're now starting to dig it. We're gonna we're waiting with uh, lick, lick, licking our lips because I can't wait till I find and dig underneath it and inside it to see if maybe that's the sanctuary that's uh, that all that we're looking for. That possibly could be it. Hold that there. Uh, even Especially in a what year Jacob from now, we'll be able to say was more. talking about maybe. Hopefully. Now let's go back to the references in the Quran to Ad Tamud Midian. Take a look, Ad Tamud and Midian. What are they round? What are they next to? Look on the map. They're around Petra. They're all around the Nabataean area and Petra. If there's any prophet who has daily contact with these people, it would be in Petra, not in Mecca. Look it at Mecca. It makes perfect right at the sense because he is surrounded by these uh, people and, and towns, I should now say. Now can you understand why there are so many references to Thamud Ad in Midian exactly. in the Quran? All the geographical cases makes it. So what's the significance? Let's now review what we have noticed so far. And here we can do a look at the slide again. What is the first thing? Nothing is known about Muhammad until the late seventh century from Arab sources. His book, the Quran, is in its manuscripts don't appear until the early eighth century. We saw that from the previous episodes that correct. we talked about. Correct, we talked about that earlier. His city, Mecca, isn't referred to until the mid eighth century, 741 to be more specific. We talked about that in early parts. His biography, the Siddha, and his sayings, the Hadith, don't appear until the early and late ninth century. We talked about that earlier. That's right. Thus, much of what we know of Muhammad is written down hundreds of years later and hundreds of miles away. It looks like he is nothing more than a later redaction. Redaction means to put back into exactly. a historical Exactly. Someone setting. reading it 200 years later as if it happened 200 years earlier. I would say not 200 years. I would say Abdul Malik. And I would say I'm just throwing this number out there. And it's almost we like you're doing it backward Malik. instead of forward. It looks like you need to go to Abdul Malik. Abdul Malik. Abdul Malik is the one we need to do that. So let's put out a possible scenario. Now this is, okay, um, Al-Fari, this is us saying in 2018. This is what we think happened. From everything we've gleaned, from everything we looked at in these episodes, what if, what is the scenario we're looking at? Let's look at the screen there. To make sense of all this, we need to begin with Abd, Abdul ibn Zubair. Abdul ibn Zubair, that's right. The governor of Petra under Abdul Malik, the Umayyad caliph from 685 to 705. <laughs> Zubair rebels in 683 against the Umayyads. He again, uh, uh, who, now look at, take a look at where their political capital is. Politically speaking, if they were Muslims, they should have been in Medina, but they're not. Uh, at least, exactly. They're way up in Damascus. That's even further north. That's right. That is not 600 miles away. That's every, almost almost 1,000 miles away, way up in the north. What are they doing way up there if their base is in Medina, in Mecca? Correct. So you can see already that all the historical reference points have it in the wrong place, according to the, I mean, for the wrong place, according to the Islamic narrative. But if you are close to Petra, it won't be that much difference. Yeah. So he 
begins at the Second Civil War, the Zubair. He destroys the Kaaba, and notice where the Kaaba is that he destroys. It's in Petra. He is the governor of Petra. He's living in Petra. And he destroys the Kaaba there in Petra, which is probably that, that thing where that mound that we have now That's seen. That's what we're in space. hoping for. We're hoping and that's he it. He stole that uh, black stone. And he takes the black stone. He refers to the black stone from there and flees to the south. Doesn't say where. I'm guessing it was to the Hejaz. The Hejaz is that central area which Mecca and Medina are a part of. That's right. That's that central area of Arabia. But he needs an ally. So what do you do? Who do you look to for an ally? Well, you can't go to the Umayyads because you're against the Umayyads. So who do you go? Who are the ones that are in conflict with the Umayyads? Now, the Umayyads are up here in Damascus, okay? I think I'm, I think I've got it right geographically. They're up here in Damascus. The Abbasids are over here in Baghdad. They were the vestiges of the Sassanid Persians. Correct. They had been defeated by the Arabs. They were absolutely, they hated the Arabs who were up here in Damascus. They hated the Umayyads. So you had these two great empires, Damascus, Baghdad. Zubair is down here in Petra. He flees down to the south. He needs an ally. So he looks over toward he the Abbasids. He has the black stone. And remember, where the black stone is, is the presence of God. The presence of God follows that black stone. That's right. This is now looking in the Nabataean culture. The black stone is referred to all the way back in the second century. We know about the black stone, possibly a meteorite. So the black stone is significant. Where is the black stone today? Kaaba. In it's in the Kaaba, in the corner. So one can assume that that's where he went. Looks like that must have been where he went, down to Mecca. Now the Abbasids over here, and they are now, they are allying themselves with this man down here. And you can see this, now there is a, a, a contest going on. And let me just clarify. I mean, I know some people look at this and say, you guys are really exaggerating. We're not exaggerating anything. We're taking data and we're making now plausible assumptions based on that. Okay, so the Abbasids who are in control of Kufa in what is today Iraq, join this rebellion and support Zubair. Now, let's take a look. Let's look at the map and you'll see what we're talking about. Can you see? Can you see where Baghdad is? Can you see where Damascus is? Those are the two black circles. Can you see where Petra is in the gold circle? And, and then Mecca can is. you see where Mecca is in the purple circle? That's right. Okay, there is the map there. Damascus is the political capital of the Umayyads. It is a thousand miles north of Mecca. Petra is a religious sanctuary for the Umayyads. It is 600 miles north of Mecca. Baghdad is the political capital of the Abbasids. Mecca is the religious sanctuary of the Abbasids. Okay? Can you then see why the Abbasids have chosen Mecca while the Umayyads have already, they've always, because they're just a, they're just a continuation of the Nabataeans. And they the have Nabataeans Petra. have always had Petra. That's that right. now helps you understand why as far away as Guangzhou in 627, while Muhammad was still living way over in China, they're facing Petra. That's because right. this is a continuation of the Nabataean sanctuary. Correct. So that's why in Cherman, in India, which is 629, again, Muhammad would still be there if Muhammad was there insignificant. We're going to show that Muhammad's not significant. Nonetheless, can you see then why they would be facing Petra? They're just continuing what the Nabataeans have always done. And remember, the Nabataeans were traders. And when they traded, they also instituted and introduced their temples in the far-off places, including places as far away as Canton and, of course, Sherman, Sherman in India. That's correct. Okay, now let's move on. Because if that is the case, you let's jump back down to these Umayyads. Remember the Umayyads, they now we do know about them. In 661, they take over. They introduce their caliphate. We don't know anything about Uthman or about Abu Bakr, or about Ali, or about uh, 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 Muhammad. We don't know of any of the first four rightly gated caliphs, Abu Bakr, Umar, Uthman, or Ali, in any other sources outside of the Islamic traditions. That's correct. So are they even historical? We don't know. We do know about the Umayyads, because they wrote about themselves. And what you have is the Umayyads in Damascus, they were looking, and they were part of the Abrahamic faith through Ishmael, through Hagar and Ishmael, that's why they call themselves Hagarines and Ishmaelites, right. but they don't have a prophetic line. The Jews do. The Christians do. They don't have a book. Who are their greatest uh, enemies? Well, their greatest enemies, of course, their biggest competition are not really the Abbasids. They're a kind of a, a, a petty thing. Their biggest problems are the Byzantines. That's the other big empire. So you have the Byzantines against the Umayyads. And the Byzantines represented Christianity. There you go. And their book is the Bible. Their man is Jesus. And they have a prophetic line through Isaac. That's correct. Jacob. All the Arabs are dependent on that prophetic line, but there is no Arabs in that prophetic line. Now you have now, roughly by the time Abdul Malik comes to power, they've now been in power for 40 years. They now control all the way 
over here from Spain to India. All that swath of land, they are the big men on the pole. They are the great uh, empire now. But they still are dependent on the Jews and Christians for their prophetic line. They don't have an Arab identity. How do you create an Arab identity to match Jews and Christians, and especially the Byzantine Empire, which are your big, your big competitors? Abdul Malik comes to power. He rules, if you look on the, on the slide there, politically from 685 to 705 in Damascus. He needs an Arab identity. The Arabs had now controlled that part of the world since 642. So he's now been in, they have been in power for 40 years. Yet from roughly 40 year period, they were dependent on Jews and Christians to run their empire. These are called the Maulas or the Mawalis. They were, the, they, were, they were urban people. The Arabs were nomadic people. Right. They did not know how to run cities. They had to use these Jews and Christians because they were brothers through Abraham. They used them to run their cities because they were much more educated. They were literate and all the rest. They were non-Arab converts who lived in cities. The Jews and the Christians had their own prophetic line, their own identity. The Arabs needed that. They had no prophetic line, no identity of their own. This identity was created in Introduced by Abdul Malik. It's Abdul Malik who does that. And let's see how he does that. Look and see what he does. That's what right. do we know about Abdul Malik from history? And I want my uh, you know, uh, viewers to watch now uh, with really pay close attention to what uh, Dr. J is going to share with you. Let's look at the slide. What does Abdul Malik do? He's now been in power for about five years. His father was the one that, that confronted the Sufyani family, threw the Sufyani family out and introduced the Marwanid families. They are introduced in 680. All right, he rules for five years and then he dies and his son takes over, Abdul Malik. Abdul Malik wants to create that Arab identity. What does he do? The first thing he does is he introduces the coins. Now take a look at those coins. These are, uh, the first coins at the very top are Byzantine dinar. You can see there is a picture of the emperor and his two retainers on That's either right. side. On the back side of the coin is the Byzantine cross. The uh, Umayyads introduced their own dinars, but they are, instead of the emperor, they introduced the caliph with two retainers, and the, they have the Byzantine cross, except the cross piece is taken off. That's right. They, you can tell that they chopped it off. Abdul Malik comes to power, and he introduces his own image. That's his image. I didn't know Muslims could do to have images. At least uh, modern-day Muslims will ah, say that. Ah, see, Muslims need to go back and ask, why is it all the Umayyad caliphs, including Abdul Malik, had images? This uh, problem with image uh, iconographic was introduced by Abdul Malik himself. He throws off his image and introduces those coins on the bottom right side. He introduces them in 692, and look what he does. He takes off his image and introduces the script. But what is he introducing? What is that that's written on that's that coin? That's the Shahada. There's the Shahada. The first time we see the Shahada is on that coin. There is only one God but God, and Muhammad is his prophet. You're now introducing a new God, and you're introducing a new man. Here is the one God and the one man. One God and one man. That is introduced on the coins. Now, on the same time, he then builds that huge structure in Jerusalem. But he's way up in Damascus. He's not living in Jerusalem. Why does he build that structure in Jerusalem? Look at the picture on the right, and you can see the Dome of the Rock is sitting above the Church of the Sepulchre. It looks down onto the Church of Sepulchre, which is the seat of the sanctuary for the, for the Byzantine Christians. He puts his structure above it, bigger than it, the most resplendent structure of its day, yeah, looking down good. onto it, basically saying, we are the new men in town. And that explains what you were saying. They had control over large swath, and now he's saying to the Jews and to the Christians, where Jerusalem is dear to them, we are superior. We are, and this is what you do. You show it by having the greatest structure. They're built on this, built by Byzantine architects. That's he what even, the Ottomans did, that's right? That's a thumb in their nose. When they thumb were in their in nose Turkey. at them. And it's built using their same uh, architectural structure, exactly. yeah. the same design. But it's the biggest one of its day. Now, let's go look at that significance of the Dome of the Rock. It employs the same Byzantine architecture, much larger and more prominent. It sits above the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. It is situated in the Holy City for Jews and Christians. Why not in Damascus or Mecca? Because that's not where the Jews and Christians are. They're in Jerusalem. Correct. The Muslims say this because of the Miraj. That's why the Miraj had to be introduced to give significance to Jerusalem. So now let's look at the only part of the Dome of the Rock that exists today. And also, if I may reference, uh, make a disreference, the, uh, the Quran made reference to this as if it's a historical thing, not a prophetic thing about the mosque. Okay. Did not talk about it as if it will be built or he ascended from the place of the future mosque. No, it talks about it as if it was there when he ascended. And so when you ask any Muslim today, and I'm talking to Muslims right now, when you ask why was the Dome of the Rock built, what do they say? 
Oh, they will say because uh, that's where the prophet ascended and to preserve that uh, holiness of that place and so on and so forth. It's to commemorate the mirage. That's right. That seven le- going up to the seven levels of heaven. That's right. Okay, if that's so, then something should be written about it. Something on the mosque should designate exactly. that, right? Exactly. So let's go back and let's look at the slide. Here is what the Dome of the Rock looks like inside. All of the outer part have been rebuilt and uh, destroyed and rebuilt 11 times. 1876, finally, you get that outer structure that we have today. But the only original part are those two inner ambulatories that you see there pictured at the very center of the building. Now, when you look at those ambulatories, you need to look at the inscriptions, which are part of the original structure. Those inscriptions are in Arabic on the outer ambulatory, on the upper dome, and on the inner ambulatory. You, those green arrows are pointing to where those inscriptions are today. You can read them. They're in Arabic. And look and see what they say. They say nothing about the mirage. What do they say? Well, they, you have Surah 4, Ayah 171. Go ahead and read what they say. They're just refuting Christianity, basically, saying all oh, people of the scripture in chapter 4, 171, denying, of course, the, uh, the, the Trinity, as you can see, say not three. So it's confronting the Trinity, it's confronting Jesus, and it's confronting his sonship. That's right. Then you have Surah 17, I 111. Who praise be to God who hath not taken unto himself a son. There is confronting Jesus the as a son. Fatherhood of God, God and the son, sonship and of Fatherhood Jesus. as well. Who hath no partner. That's Surah 5, uh, reflecting also Surah 5, Ayah 72. Misunderstanding the Trinity, of course. Absolutely. Yeah. And nor hath he any protecting friend through dependence. He's not dependent on anybody else like Jesus. That's confronting Jesus, his Christology, his divinity, and the Trinity. That's confronting the whole center, the central uh, theology of the Byzantines, Christianity. Yeah. Then you have Surah 112. Now, this is fascinating. There is no God but God. There's the Shahada. He is one, that's the first part of the Shahada. He has no associate, that's against Jesus. He is God, the one God, the eternal besought of all. He begetteth not, nor was begotten. Who's that confronting? Jesus. Begotten son. That's right. And then it says, and there is none comparable unto him. Muhammad is the messenger of God. Muhammad. So it confronts the God of Christianity and it introduces the prophet's name. That's the first time we see the prophet's name. It's introduced on the coins, it's introduced on the Dome of the Rock, and then on top of that, it's also introduced on the protocols, the Caliphal protocols. These are the official documents. Now, Dr. Jehud never looked at the protocols, and he noticed that all the way from the, the Sufiani period, there is no reference to Muhammad, no reference to Muslims, no reference to Islam on any of the protocols. There is no Shahada there. There's no reference to any Quran until 691. That's yeah. the date. The dates of the Quran, the Dome of the Rock is being built. That's also the year before the coins are introduced That's with the correct. Shahada on it. That's correct. In 691, almost overnight, the Shahada is introduced on all the protocols. And from that time on, in 691, every protocol starts with the Shahada. So, beginning with the Dome of the Rock, it's the largest uh, structure than any other Arab structure. It's facing the Arab sanctuary, Petra. It incorporates inscriptions against Byzantine Christianity. It introduces the faith Islam. It introduces the people Muslim. It introduces the Prophet Muhammad. The Caliph protocols change overnight in 691. Then he mints new coins in 692. So he places the images with Arabic script and introduces the Shahada on the coins. So now you have it on the structure of the mosque, you have it on the coins, and you have it in the protocols. Right. The Shahada is introduced. Once Abdul Malik introduces Muhammad, he then needs to have an Arab revelation. Here is the problem. So that comes after he has introduced the prophet. Every prophet has to have a book. The earliest Quranic texts are on the Dome of the Rock in 691. The earliest Quranic manuscripts begin to appear during his reign. The below the lower texts of the Sana that we talked about in the la- former that's right. episodes, that's in the late 7th century. The Quranic manuscripts begin to proliferate during the reign of his son Al-Walid from 705 to 715. None of the manuscripts are complete, nor they are parallel to the Quran completely. They continue to be changed and corrected by later caliphs up until the 9th century. The Quran is finally canonized uh, at Al-Azhar University in Cairo in 1924, just in this case, it should be 94 years ago. And finally, as we shall see, there is still currently 31 different versions of the Arabic Quran that even exist today. They need a place. So what do they do? Two empires are competing again. Here we're now putting the whole scenario together. The Umayyad and later the Nabate, uh, an, an earlier Nabataean sanctuary in Petra is destroyed by an earthquake in 713. Remember I told you 713 is important. 
Once you have an earthquake that destroys a sanctuary, God's presence leaves from that place. Now can you see why that even the Umayyads needed to find a new place? They could not use uh, Petra anymore. That's correct. Thus, a new place is needed. Mecca is first noted in 727. That's the first mosque that we know. There may be earlier ones that are closer, but that's the first one that exists still today. Possibly chosen by the rebel Abdul al bin Zubair and those in, from Kufa, the Abbasids, in defiance of the Umayyads in Petra, the Abbasids and Zubair with the sanctuary in Mecca then demand allegiance to the surrounding tribes. All those Qiblas facing Mecca are those who are ally themselves with the Abbasids. Al-Hajjaj then comes in the uh, about 704 Five, he rebels also against them, and it is his mosques which are facing in between the other two sanctuaries, That's right. waiting to see who's going to win out on this battle. So he's been very clever, clever not to give allegiance to either the Abbasids or the Umayyads. He's already rebelled against the Umayyads. Those in North Africa and in Andalusia don't show allegiance to either empire, so have mosques facing parallel to each sanctuary. And when the Abbasids finally overpowered the Umayyads in 749, most of the Qiblas then face Mecca with a few holdouts until 8. 22, after which they all face Mecca up to the present time. Now, here we're going to end now. Here is what we, if the what if possibility. The Muslims have a prophet introduced in 691. They need a revelation. That's where the Quran starts to be introduced in 705 and later. A sanctuary then is needed. That doesn't come till 741. Then they need a history. Can you then understand? You've got all these other places. Right. Oh, you've got to place this man in history. Can you now understand why the Siddha is not introduced till 833? Because now you need a history. The Hadith are not introduced until 870. Because you need teachings. There you go. The Tafsir is not introduced until 923. You need explanation of this new book. By the 9th century, they now have a book, the man, the place, and the story. A new religion is formed and growing, not from within 22-year period, but evolving over two to 300 years. Now that makes sense. What about Muhammad? Well, since we, much of what we know about him in early Islam is in doubt, since much of the Quran is also in doubt, since nothing is known of Muhammad until the 7th century, or Mecca until the mid-8th century, or his story until the 9th century, hundreds of years later and hundreds of miles away, can we then conclude, and here we're going to get now, can we then conclude that Islam is nothing more than a later redaction, possibly begun by Abdul Malik, started with him, then continued by his descendants, proving Muhammad had nothing to do with the Quran? So who is he and what is his purpose? It looks like the Muslims have the wrong man at the wrong place, doing the wrong thing at the wrong time. One more slide. What about Jesus? Let's Amen. end with Jesus. Amen to that. How should we critique him? Using the same historical criteria I've just used for Muhammad and Islam, we know where Jesus was born. He was born in Bethlehem. We know where Jesus grew up. He grew up in Nazareth. We know where Jesus died and, and when in Jerusalem, even the year he died, 33 AD. We know what Jesus did for the last three years of his ministry. We know this all from eyewitness accounts, Matthew and John. We know this as well from hostile accounts, Thallus, Tacitus, Josephus. Thallus was Greek. Tacitus was Roman. Josephus was Jewish. None of them are Christians. These are critical accounts, yet they all support what the Bible says on his death there. We know when they were written between 50 to 60 years by the eyewitness and those who knew the eyewitnesses. We know that few that we know that few doubt his history. And nobody doubts who Jesus was or where he lived or that where he died. Thus, Christians have the right man at the right place doing the right thing at the right time. Amen. Can you see what we're, we've done here? Amen. In Amen. one fell swoop, Amen. we have shown using historical historic. Uh, we see, we've just used historical evidence. We've used names, dates, places, events. We've looked at manuscript. We did that earlier in the early one. We've looked at artifacts, and we've looked at what is still existing today, the Qiblas, the mosques. In every case, we have seen that they, they have, the mosques are facing the wrong direction. We don't have any reference to people called Muslims or Islam or Book of the Quran or even Muhammad really as a prophet until the Dome of the Rock and the coins and, of course, the protocols. That's 60 years too late. And we have no reference to Mecca until 741, not even put on maps until the 900s. Mm. I thank God I don't have to defend Muhammad amen. or the Quran. Amen and amen. Thank you so much, brother. You can see why um, having Dr. J. Smith with us here has been a huge blessing to all of us and uh, allowing us also to unpack this rich information that probably some of you have seen it in longer seminars and we intended really to take it and piecemeal it so that it's easier for everyone to track the arguments and come back to it again. Uh, Dr. J, thank you so much. Hopefully you can jo continue to join me at least in the next uh, you know, few days uh, to keep talking about 
other issues related to Islam and its history and its theology. God bless you. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Here is my appeal to you as my Muslim friends. You need to know now the right God who sent the right word to reveal the right man who knows the right way back to God. God bless you and hope to see you in eternity. Thanks for watching. Make sure to like and subscribe so that you don't miss future videos. And please consider becoming a patron on patreon.com forward slash Sierra International.